Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining. This is Caitlin. Um, we're going to dive right in because we have a lot of slides. Um, Lisa is also on the line. If you want to say hi, Lisa. I did. I just said hi, but I think I might have spoken at the same time as you. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Thanks so much for being here. Yay. Um, so I'm going to start this. And if you can't see our slides for any reason, just uh, comment in the chat um, and let us know that something's going wrong. <laughs> but um, if all is well, then we're going to jump right in. So this is a presentation that um, we recently did at the Animal I Image Makers Conference um, in Minnesota. So um, some of it is really focused on getting started as a pet photographer who's interested in doing some of the work of our Artists Helping Animals program. But we kept it in here because there's some really great um, content that I think will be uh, inspiring and maybe rejuvenating for those of you that are already doing this work or have been doing it for a long time. So I got one message that says they're not seeing the slides. Um, let me see. Where are you getting the message? Oh, um, I'm not either, but I just for a split second. Oh, and I'm also seeing Caitlin, your um, navigate. Yeah. Are we good now? Yep. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, Tracy, for telling me. <laughs> Otherwise, I would have just been it's talking to myself for 90 minutes. Um, okay. So it's going to, that navigation will pop up until I get rid of this uh, sidebar, I think. So um, we're going to dive right in because we have a lot of slides, <laughs> not a lot of time. And um, as I was saying, because this was, you know, kind of an existing presentation for a conference, we have some slides in here about HeartSpeak. Um, but what I what we decided to do was to keep some of these in here, because um, although you know about HeartSpeak because you're part of our, one of our core programs, you may not know um, much about kind of why and how HeartSpeak was started. Um, so I'm going to let Lisa kind of uh, tell the story of the founding of HeartSpeak and, and why we exist. <laughs> so this is my dog, Iggy. Um, many of us are inspired by an animal we adopted, and my inspiration for starting HeartSpeak was this incredibly gorgeous, kind, sweet guy, and his name was Iggy. After adopting him, in 2005, my eyes were open to the magnitude of the problems facing homeless animals. Mainly that dogs and cats just like him were waiting to be adopted across the country and that the number that ultimately found homes, like, you know, found a life like he had, was disproportionate to those that didn't. Um, Caitlin, can you go to the next screen, please? Oh. <laughs> So um, again, the problem, amazing dogs and cats, just like Iggy were waiting for homes across the country, but close to half weren't finding them. One person alone can only have so much impact and obviously it takes a village. Heart Speaks Artists Helping Animals program was started because I was determined to find people who are willing to basically set aside their egos and work together to find a solution to animal homelessness through creativity and art. HeartSpeak seeks to break down barriers and build bridges. Um, it focuses on always remembering to focus on what our end goal is, which is saving animals and setting aside competition, embracing collaboration and community to get there. And that's the story. <laughs> and that's where all of you come in because you're kind of living that out in everyday life, which is really, um, I think, the most amazing part of this process yeah. is going from that vision to the execution um, and, and, and all the work that you guys are doing. And so amazing to meet people with that same mindset, you know? Yeah. It, it really is because I have to say initially, and then I'll stop Caitlin, but I had reached out to pet photographers that I admired and, you know, looked for advice and help and was really shocked at kind of this competitive attitude and well, I'll share, you know, I'll teach you about this if you want to pay or, you know, 
So I really enjoy and appreciate all of you who have joined the Artists Helping Animals program. Yay! <laughs> I love that. <laughs> awesome. So as you also know, um, Artists Helping Animals program is one of three, three core programs that we run right now. Um, so the, the second being the Perfect Exposure Project, which sort of grew out of a recognition that while we had so many um, amazing artists who were helping directly kind of partner with shelters, um, that the shelters and rescues weren't necessarily being empowered with skills of their own. And so really taking that concept and um, applying that through the Perfect Exposure Project looks like giving them equipment and training and trying to kind of bridge that skills gap that exists in animal welfare, um, which we'll talk a little bit more about. Um, and the third core program is the HeartSpeak EDU and Publicity program, um, which then grew out of a need that we saw where the Perfect Exposure Project, um, you know, wasn't filling every single gap. We were, were not able to get to every single shelter and rescue that requests that program just because of funding and sheer, you know, physics of not being able to be <laughs> in more than one place at a time. Um, so the EDU program is really meant to um, put a lot of that content, a lot of that educational content, and a lot of that um, marketing content online so that it's constantly accessible to anybody working or volunteering in animal sheltering. Love that. Yeah, um, so here, um, again, this was to kind of shout from the rooftops how amazing you all are <laughs> to, to this outside audience, but I think it's really important um, for, for all of us that are part of this program to reflect on this every once in a while that at any given time, the work that you're doing is part of this much bigger collaborative movement. And I know that sometimes, you know, we all have those days where we feel very alone in some of this, or we're not, we're not quite keyed into how many other folks are, um, you know, having the same victories and sometimes the same struggles that we're having. So we have around 500 uh, plus professional artist members every single year. That number pretty stays pretty much consistent. Um, we're currently in 20 countries. And at last uh, that we did the survey, which was now two years ago, we're kind of due for a new one, but there was 15,000 uh, or more hours of creative service donated monthly to the shelters and rescues that you all are working with, which is a seriously, seriously, <laughs> seriously impressive number um, of hours. So this is my uh, disclaimer, and this was my super disclaimer at a pet photography conference. <laughs> I felt like I needed to be really straightforward about the fact that um, I myself am not a pet photographer. <laughs> I'm actually not any kind of photographer <laughs> other than, um, you know, I've a decent her. cell phone photographer, I'll say. <laughs> <laughs> um, no. Yeah, Lisa's always very kind to me, but I, <laughs> I, ha I don't come by this with any kind of any kind of training. Um, but I have spent the kind of the perspective that I bring to the table um, as kind of one half of the HeartSpeak team now is the animal welfare kind of experience. So I have worked um, in one form or another in animal welfare for 11 years. Um, for a long time on kind of the advocacy and grant making and legislative side of things. Um, and, and also working a lot with organizations on things like adoption policies and removing barriers and doing whatever we could, including a lot of talking about marketing to reach new audiences. Um, and so that's kind of the, the perspective that I try to imbue a little bit of our work with um, the same way that, that you know, we're, we're always touching back on our roots as well um, as an organization. So here's what we're gonna talk about tonight. Um, and I am notorious for having probably too many slides and being a little bit too verbose. So we'll, we'll go as quickly as we can through some of this, but I, I also want this to be a valuable kind of experience for everybody. But we'll talk about first kind of this, this question of why give back and so many of you already have answered that question for yourself on a personal level but also looking at kind of the big picture of the, the effect that we're having in the field of animal welfare um, getting started for those of you who are still trying to connect with shelters and again even if you're already working with a shelter or rescue I think there's some good stuff in that section that is um, serves as a good reminder and just kind of good inspiration and then maintaining and thriving, because that is the name of the game, is that we want all of you to be in this for the long haul. We want everyone to feel 
um, appreciated and, and well and able to do this work for as long as possible. And animal welfare can be a, a difficult field sometimes. So, um, and I do have to say, all of the images in, in this presentation are member images, either from Im the Images with Heart uh, project that we have, the stock photography project, or um, images that, that you all so, so graciously have taken um, in recent years. So first and foremost, I think it's really important, I'm a little bit of a data nerd, so <laughs> I really like to know um, not just why anecdotally something is working and feels good, but also what kind of impact it's having um, in terms of the numbers. So I don't know, I think a lot of you have seen this study that um, a, a fellow member, Mary Wood, did as part of her master's thesis. Um, but what she did was she looked at um, the impact of dog adoption photos. And I think that a lot of this is a, a really strong selling point, especially if you are you know, just starting to work with a shelter or you're working with an organization that maybe is a little bit resistant um, to bringing in a photographer, an artist, um, I think it's important to, to pull out some of these facts for them. So 65% of the adopters that were surveyed viewed photos of dogs online before adopting. So people are, are shopping around, which is something that I think we've always guessed is happening, but it's nice to know that that's true. Um, dogs that appear happy in photos are more likely to be considered for adoption and dogs that appeared neutral or sad were not as likely to sway. So all of this again feels very um, natural and I think things that we would have guessed but it, it's always good to kind of check in with the data. I think it's also interesting that um, participants rated the most important types of photos as photos that were sh uh, clearly showing an animal's face, photos of the dog's full body, photos showing personality. So, and there's a lot of interpretations we can do around some of these factors and we'll, we'll go over some examples. But I also find it incredibly interesting that nine out of 10 adopters use online photos to compare several dogs. So very much in that vein of, um, I'm not quite sure, so I'm shopping around. <laughs> and those photos can make a huge difference in, in the decisions that people are making. Um, so again, all of this goes towards our, um, are kind of feeling already in our mission of uh, the fact that good photos are truly life-saving, that this isn't just uh, something that we say, this isn't just lip service or something that we um, you know, fundraise on, this is true and the data, the data shows that. Here's a little bit uh, more from our Perfect Exposure Project. Uh, what we found was by looking at um, the length of stay for animals, in our Perfect Exposure Project partner shelters that uh, a photo could be the difference between them staying, um, I think on average, one of the shelters was seeing a 30 plus uh, length of stay. And after uh, new photos, they saw a less than 12 days length of stay. So that's how we kind of arrive at, at this, uh, I think a pretty impressive statistic <laughs> that um, a good photo can help shelter pets find a home up to 60% faster. And I think length of stay isn't something that we always talk about. We talk a lot about um, life-saving in terms of euthanasia and live release rates and things like that, and that's all very important. But equally important is how long animals are, are sitting around and waiting for homes, because the longer that they sit, the more, more um, you know, they have a risk of disease, the more that they have a risk of um, not being as enriched as they could be and, and kind of degrading that way as well. So the faster we can move animals through our system, not only helps those individual animals, but also means that we are helping to make space for more animals who will need that safety net of a shelter or a rescue. So the other things that I want us to kind of be reminded of and, and be excited about are that there are a lot of different people, a broad audience, have the opportunity to see the work done by yourselves. Um, and we also have the opportunity to dispel myths and change the way that people think about shelters in general as we kind of take these amazing photos that are good for individual animals, but even better for kind of that overall storytelling of the work that's done in shelters and rescues. Um, when I when I talk with shelters and rescues about this issue, I typically ask um, for a show of hands and say, you know, how many of you feel like the work that you do is completely misunderstood on one 
end of the spectrum or the other. So people either think that uh, shelter staff and volunteers are rolling around on the floor with puppies and kittens all day, or that there are, um, you know, terrible things happening in shelters and that it's not a safe place for animals. And for the most part, all hands go up in, in that kind of situation. And the images that you're taking have the power to start to push back against some of that. So um, well, I'll show you some examples as we go through the presentation, but this kind of image on this slide where we have just someone's legs and a hand, that kind of connection that's being built, not only is that great for this individual dog, Otter, but it's also really intrinsic to telling the bigger, broader story of this is a shelter, people at this shelter care for these animals, you need to start rethinking everything that you think you know about shelters. And that's ultimately the messaging that we're putting out into the community. Um, so a big part of what we focus on that you may not be aware of, but especially when we're working with shelters and rescues on the concept of shelter marketing is, um, is this term positive marketing. So what I want you to consider is what you think when you see the little dog behind bars in black and white and this kind of traditional, um, you know, maybe the, maybe a Sarah McLaughlin song <laughs> is playing uh, in the background of your mind. Um, this kind of traditional, what is termed, not my term, this is an industry term, uh, guilt marketing in the fundraising world. Um, so those images serve a specific purpose and that is to make people feel like they're a little bit helpless to change the situation, but what they could do is donate a small amount of money and make a difference. And that's certainly something that not just national organizations rely on a lot of individual, um, smaller, you know, humane societies, SPCAs, um, county and municipal shelters. We all kind of have, have come to rely on this model of fundraising, but I want you to consider what that does in the bigger picture. So a, a big focus of my, I would say life in animal welfare <laughs> is this question of what are the un unintended consequences. And I think it's something worth asking ourselves, even when we're taking a photo, even if we're not putting together an entire campaign, but knowing that all of these images go back to serving that larger purpose, um, asking what is the unintended consequence of this, I think is a good place to start. So to give you an example on the opposite end of the spectrum, Austin Humane Society uh, launched this incredibly positive marketing campaign that you see um, in the larger photo on the screen. So we have uh, this beautiful dog and then we have these really fun kind of um, focus words on the human animal bond, right? So you scratch, I sniff, you throw, I chase, you hear, I'm there and we keep following this down. You eat, I eat faster. So there's a little bit of humor involved as well. Um, you cry, I understand, also really heartfelt kind of terms involved. And we land on you pick me, I heart you, and then we have the logo of the organization. And their new tagline, which was launched as part of this campaign, was Unleash Hope. And what I want you to consider is that this organization embarked upon this positive marketing campaign because that traditional kind of quote unquote guilt marketing wasn't necessarily working for them anymore. Um, not only is it, you know, kind of stressful sometimes for your followers and your donors to be constantly faced with uh, sad messaging or things that make them feel a little bit helpless, it's also what a lot of other groups are doing. And so it's hard to stand out from the crowd sometimes when that's, that's the effort. So with this new positive marketing campaign, and they did a series of these photos and, um, overlays as well as a couple of videos and they worked with a pro bono um, PR firm in their city but what they saw was they doubled their year-end annual appeal donations to a hundred thousand dollars so a level that they had never ever reached before uh, they had a 13 percent rise in contributions throughout the entire year so outside of just that annual appeal they increased adoptions by nearly 10 percent which is certainly nothing to sneeze at and they increase volunteer activity by 55,000 hours. So all of this is to say, this isn't just about fundraising, right? This is about the way that the community starts to receive the information. And the reason that I bring this up is, A, it's really kind of a core tenet of HeartSpeak um, and the information that we're teaching to shelters and, and rescues, um, this, this idea of positive marketing. And so I want you to know about it. 
But I also want us to consider how we can help shelters get there with the images that we're taking and with the work that we're doing as artists helping animals. So the other, uh, you know, as part of my confession to being a data nerd, <laughs> um, the other thing that really drives me personally and that I like to reflect on for us as an organization and, and for me as an individual is this data, which is a couple years old now. It came from the Humane Society of the United States, um, Maddie's Fund and the Shelter Pet Project, which all work together. Um, but what they did was they found that 29 million people a year are considering a new pet. But of that 29 million, 17 million are undecided about where they will get a pet. And I want you to like let that soak in for a second because <laughs> 17 million people is a lot of people and we know that they have endless amounts of choices, right? So they have pet stores looking them in the face, they have um, breeders in the community, responsible and irresponsible, both, right? They have neighbors who have accidental litters, they have um, any number of kind of grassroots ways of getting animals. And then they have adoption agencies, whether it's a rescue or a shelter. Um, and the other thing that I find really kind of interesting is that at the highest estimate, 30% of animals living in, in um, homes today were adopted from shelters. And some studies say even lower, so somewhere more around 25%. But if we were able to change just a couple million minds, right, just two to three million, not only do we increase the percentage of animals living in homes who are adopted, we also start to tap into the same number of animals that are being euthanized for space and, and not for medical or behavioral reasons, but just for space reasons. So let, let, let's let that kind of also drive some of our, um, our conversation and our inspiration. So I'm gonna talk a, lot, a little bit about um, getting started. I know that most of you that are um, attending tonight are kind of well, well established within your organizations so I'm gonna gloss over some of this, um, but I, I do also want this to be helpful for members who may watch this in the future who are just kind of tapping into a relationship with a shelter or rescue. So one thing that I think we all know, especially if you've been doing this a little bit, <laughs> a little while, is that shelter photography will be different than client photography, right? So there's so many uncontrollable factors. There's fewer resources typically. You definitely have to be able to roll with the punches and. Um, change location sometimes or, or know that the, the situation is not always gonna go smoothly. Um, and I think that one thing that makes me so proud of the community of artists helping animals is that you all lift each other up in those moments. So when someone comes to the discussion group and says, I had a photo shoot today and it did not go <laughs> the way that I was expecting, I love, love, love that you all can kind of um, give advice from that same place and can can lift each other into a you know into suggestions that will uh, help with success in the future. So that's just the first piece of the puzzle I think is is having that acceptance that it's not always going to go to plan. The um, important thing not just about getting started in sheltering but I would say in staying successful in this field is understanding the landscape of sheltering. And this is a tough one sometimes because um, in my experience, we all come to this work with um, different information, different background. And what happened to me and what happened to a lot of my friends that work in this field is you kind of end up getting flooded with information <laughs> and, and from a lot of different sources. And some of those sources are conflicting about information, right? So we have open admission shelters, we have private or limited admission shelters, we have rescues, and then there's a whole lot of language that goes along with some of this. So I'm gonna walk through this um, briefly, but I, I think it's an important conversation to have. So really, really important to understand that open admission shelters cannot turn away animals. They can manage their intakes, meaning that they can ask people to wait um, and hold animals at home or keep them in foster but ultimately they don't have the option of saying, no, we will not take your animal. Um, and so managed admissions are something that, you know, that's another buzzword term that you might wanna look into if that's something you're curious about. But um, these shelters, these open admission shelters are often the ones that have a higher intake. Um, so there's more pressure of time. Um, and I know that those of you that work with open admission shelters feel that sometimes. 
Um, it's also really critical to note that these are often the shelters that get termed with that quote unquote kill shelter label, which we're gonna talk about in a moment um, and how much I don't want you to use that term in the future, um, if at all possible, but keep in mind that th this is part of that bigger picture. Private or limited admission shelters are shelters that um, may only take in pets transferred from other organizations, typically not from the public, um, and usually only at certain times. So they have the kind of the luxury of being able to say, we're full, so we're just not gonna take in any animals right now. Um, that doesn't always happen. It doesn't always <laughs> work out that way. But again, that bigger picture understanding is that they may be able to provide more time to find homes. Um, but that doesn't also mean that they're necessarily no kill. So we're also gonna, <laughs> gonna consider all of this. Rescue, on the other hand, um, and the purpose of rescue is really to alleviate the pressure on especially those open admission shelters. So when rescues kind of first um, started in the field of animal welfare, it was to take animals out of the sheltering system so that there wasn't so much pressure on population within shelters and, and needing to euthanize simply for space. So rescues are really an intrinsic part of, of any kind of life-saving strategy in the community. Um, but rescue can look many, many different ways, as I'm sure most of you know. So um, most rescues are foster-based, but not all. Some have facilities. Um, some have a community breed or species-specific kind of um, governance involved in them, right? So they may only take one kind of animal or one breed of dog or cat. Um, and they don't necessarily have uh, the same kind of oversight that some of the shelters have. So that's, that's just another important piece of the puzzle. So here's where we have a pretty critical conversation, I think, um, whether you have just started or whether you've been doing this a long time. Um, the field of animal welfare can feel really polarized sometimes. Um, for those that have been doing this a very long time, working within it, um, some of the most recent years feel the most polarized, especially around this term of kill shelter and no kill, right? So as folks supporting shelters, I would highly encourage you to think about the nuance um, that is involved in, in some of what we just talked about really quickly. But the shelters that are often getting called kill shelter, we kind of throw that term around really without thinking about it. Um, and we know inside the field of animal welfare what that means sometimes. Um, it means that, that animals are being euthanized sometimes for reasons other than medical or behavioral needs. But there's so much more going on in a situation where that's happening typically. So usually those sh shelters are open in mission. Usually those shelters are under-resourced usually those shelters have a different kind of pressure on them in a lot of different ways. And so I would really encourage you, if this is something that has snuck its way into your vocabulary, to, to kind of tap yourself on the shoulder when you go to say kill shelter and say, what do I really wanna be saying? Do I really wanna be saying the city shelter or the county shelter or the shelter that my rescue works with? And am I using language that reflects the partnership that I wanna be that I wanna be showing. Um, I, I got really good advice when I first came into the field of animal welfare that um, you know, language was gonna be the most important part of the work that I did. And I, it took me a little while to figure out what exactly that meant. But I think one of the things that we do, um, both as volunteers and as staff members in this field, is sometimes let our insider speak or the way that we would talk to each other sneak out and into the public. And that's where I think this term kill shelter has come about is that we have been lazy about the way that we are talking and the, the uh, community picks that up. But what it does is it vilifies one shelter as um, you know, doing something that most people will look at as, as evil or as extremely toxic um, and it's just not that simple and so whether or not you work with an organization that you know is not able to call itself no kill or you don't i am of the opinion that it doesn't make it okay to vilify one shelter in order to kind of elevate another organization so really just kind of let let some of that sink in and, and think about 
again, the unintended consequences of some of the language that we use. Um, and there are some resources I would be happy to point you guys to that are kind of uh, these industry conversations of, you know, what, what should we be saying if we're not comfortable saying no kill? What should we be saying in place of kill shelter and all of that kind of thing? That could be its own presentation <laughs> for sure. Um, also understanding that SPCAs, humane societies, and municipalities are all different, right? So, so just knowing, uh, especially when you're first getting started, but even sometimes I, I run into this confusion with people that are very well established in the field, but um, SPCAs and humane societies aren't related to any kind of national organization. They typically don't receive na national funding. Um, they may receive a grant from a national organization, but that's very different from being a subsidiary of one of those organizations. Um, and then just realize that municipalities uh, sometimes enforce laws, sometimes they don't. Sometimes a private shelter will have a contract for um, humane law enforcement or for animal control. And it's really important just to do some of your research and kind of understand what this landscape of animal welfare and animal sheltering looks like in your specific community. Because I, I truly believe the more well-informed you are on some of these issues, the more you can really help in a very meaningful way. So some other terms, um, and again, I think most of us on this call tonight know some of this, but it, it's worth kind of revisiting. Um, owner surrender and return to owner are two really important terms to understand. So owner surrender is when animals are um, brought to the shelter by uh, reason of their, their owner no longer being able to care for them. Um, one thing that has really changed and is, is still, you know, we're still chipping away at it in this field, but um, by and large, the movement nationally is to be less uh, kind of judgmental about those situations of owner surrender and really understanding that there are some complex situations, social situations that lead people to surrender animals and that by being more open and less judgmental, we end up with better information about the animals who are being surrendered. And that in turn helps us place those animals faster and better. So, so realizing that again, there's, um, there's big reasons why we need to, to make changes in this field. And sometimes it's not as simple as, oh, we just decided to be less judgy <laughs> about this. The, the real impact is that it helps us help animals better. And, and that's an important consideration. Um, return to owner is like happy dance city, right? <laughs> so it means that an animal who was brought in as a stray um, was found by his or her owner and it's pretty much the best feeling ever. Um, animal control or animal services, really important to, to note that um, most communities are no longer referring to those organizations as the pound um, and that that language is very outdated at this point. So we wanna be saying things like animal services. Um, there's a big push nationally in the field of animal welfare to be calling them uh, animal care centers and really reflecting that it is a resource for the community and not an organization to be afraid of because that kind of barrier in, in providing services and safety nets can again be bad for animals. If people are afraid to approach animal control or animal services for fear that they are, um, you know, a terrible place for animals or, or a scary place, you know, for people to interact, um, then, then we're not able to reach as many animals as we would like. So considering again, that bigger picture Live release rate, um, which is sometimes abbreviated as LRR or save rate, um, refers to the percentage of animals leaving facility via adoption, transfer, return to owner, or any other method um, that does not include uh, euthanasia typically. Um, th there are multiple ways of calculating this. So that's also an important consideration. Um, again, a whole other presentation, <laughs> but I'm happy to to provide you guys with some resources if it's something that you're interested in. There's um, an Asilomar way to calculate this. Um, there is a couple of different organizations that, that calculate this rate differently. Um, and, and each one of those will give you a different percentage. So it's, it's important to know some of that. So again, in this vein of to, um, you know, getting started, but also I think sometimes this is a good reminder for those of us that have been at this for quite a while is choosing the right fit, right? So now that we know that there are a number of different kinds of organizations and a number of different considerations, you know, including um, if an organization is billing itself as no-kill or if they haven't yet reached that, uh, that level of life-saving, 
what you ultimately need to do is find the right fit for you personally. And no one else can tell you what that is. And, and we certainly don't want to dictate to you what um, the right organization to be working with is. Because from our perspective, working with any animal welfare organization in your community is helping that bigger picture, right? So if you're working with a rescue and maybe they have a, um, a lower intake, they don't adopt out as many animals as the shelter, you're still doing incredible life-saving work because the more animals that move through that rescue, the more animals are pulled from the shelter into that rescue and so on and so forth. So in, from our perspective, there is no job too small or too big. Um, and that what is the most important is finding a good fit that allows you to do this work for as long as possible because longevity is the name of the game in all of this. Um, that whole cliche of it's a marathon and not a sprint <laughs> is very, very true in animal welfare. And, and we want you to be happy and healthy in the work that you're doing um, in this field. Okay, so I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna really go over this because I, again, I don't think it's super relevant to tonight and I'm sure I'm already going over the time that I allotted <laughs> for this, this part of the conversation. Um, but what I will say is if you're struggling to connect with an organization, um, I think that a multitude of things can be solved by an in-person meeting, by um, you know, letting down some of our barriers uh, as, as artists um, and, and understanding a little bit more about how shelters operate, understanding that sometimes when someone doesn't call you back immediately, it's not because they don't want you to help, but sometimes it's because they're unsure of what you're offering or they're not, they've never worked with a photographer or an artist before. And so they're just not sure what to expect. And so the more that we can kind of break down those barriers and say like, hey, we're not high maintenance. We just really wanna help animals the same way that you do. And here's our specific area of expertise. Um, I think that that's huge in, in helping to kind of get more shelters and rescues on board and excited about partnering with, with all of us. Um, the number one tip, if I had to distill everything that is in our getting started guide, um, which I think many of you, uh, especially if you joined in the last couple of years, received when you became a member, is that um, volunteer training is a key to success. So it used to be, I think, uh, when a lot of us got started in this field, um, and it's probably because organizations didn't have <laughs> their volunteer training always kind of buttoned up and nailed down the way that the way that a lot of it is standardized today. Um, but a lot of times we were, as photographers or as artists, circumventing that volunteer training. And I would argue that it's the single most important thing that you could do. So even if you don't think that you're personally gonna be handling the animals all the time, even if um, you're gonna work with other staff and volunteers to run dogs for you or to uh, you know, dictate to you which cats to work with and all of that good stuff, I think it's still really important to understand that bigger picture of the organization and what the policies and protocols are. Um, because let's say you're not handling animals on a daily basis, but while you're there photographing a dog or a cat, um, an animal gets loose, maybe not even in your area, but an animal gets loose at the shelter. Do you know what to do? And do you know how to handle that and how the organization wants you to handle that safely and successfully? And can you be of help in that moment? Or are you potentially putting yourself and other people at risk by not knowing what some of those protocols are? And that's just one example. But I would say at the end of the day, we're working with animals who are owned legally by the shelter or rescue. And so it's really critical that we know how that organization would want us to be handling different situations involving those animals. And it also, tends to make people a lot more open and excited about the work that you're offering to do. Um, so some of the other kind of frequently asked questions that we get is, uh, so what kind of contract should I have with the organization? This is something that comes up in the discussion group a lot. Um, and this is a pretty personal decision. Um, and it's, it's largely dependent on both your personal kind of taste and as well as the, the organization and what they are gonna want um, as well. Remember that contracts are, are legal in nature. And so I would encourage you to kind of look at um, what would be offered by someone like a lawyer or some, some sort of uh, sample contract rather than just making it up 
um, as you go along. Um, be aware though that for some municipal organizations, whether they're county or city or town, um, a contract may delay you being able to get started just slightly because typically with those organizations, there is a legal department that needs to take a look at any kind of contract. That's totally fine. It's just something to prepare yourself for um, that you can get stuck in a little bit of red tape sometimes with, with the different legal departments of the muni municipality. Um, also consider if there is a way to still have your needs met as a photographer and as an artist, as well as the organizations by having kind of a meeting of the minds with someone in leadership um, and coming to some agreement points. Um, and, and really taking into consideration not only what works really well for you, but what is ultimately going to take into consideration the shelter's needs and their timelines and kind of what their struggles are. Because at the end of the day, we're there to kind of support them through, um, you know, being able to, to have a system that's not only getting them beautiful images, but that takes into account efficiency and effectiveness and getting those images out to the public quickly as well. So, so having a conversation about um, turnaround time for images and all of that is, is equally important, I would say. Um, also, a big question that we get is how can I get a shelter or rescue to credit me for more consistently? And I find that this is another one of those um, areas where when a shelter is not doing that, typically, and to give them the benefit of the doubt, it may be that they have never considered what it means to give credit and, and why it's important, right? Um, so the same way that, you know, all of us as members are really doing our level, level best to find out as much as we can about animal sheltering so that we can communicate effectively and be of the most help. I think that sometimes uh, shelters need to learn a little bit more about what it is to work with, um, with artists and with professionals. Um, and that's something that we work on as HeartSpeak, you know, trying to, to level the playing field on both sides. But when you are having kind of a moment of conflict over credit, I want you to first consider, am I jumping to conclusions that this, it, that someone is doing something on purpose or nefariously? Is there a way that I can have this conversation where I can explain why this is important to me? And is there also a point that I can compromise on? Um, and again, this is gonna look different for every single one of us. Um, but it's something that I think is worth asking yourself before before you um, go in guns blazing, you know, and upset about about that um, when it's going wrong. Um, I think also again having that meeting of the minds and being able to say, here's what this relationship would look like in an ideal world to me, but why don't you explain to me what it, that would look like to you as the shelter? Because maybe there's some middle ground that we can find here. So again. And this goes for, you know, again, not just getting started, but kind of maintaining relationships with shelters and rescues. The keys to a lasting partnership are the keys to any good relationship, right? So communication, mutual respect, which is a really important one, um, collaborative spirit and patience. And, and along with that patience, I think is some of that understanding that sometimes we're coming from very different worlds or very different experiences. And it may not be that someone is purposely putting up barriers. It may just be that they don't understand um, where you're coming from or, or why um, you want to do things one way. And, and they maybe have always done it a different way. So I, and again, the kind of to wrap up the getting started part of this presentation, um, our last piece of advice would be to decide on your commitment um, and consider all the factors that go along with that, because that's also um, going to be something that sets you up for success and also sets every other person that comes along after you who may want to work with this organization for success because I know some of you have had this experience and I've certainly heard it from shelters and rescues but sometimes they have one bad experience with um, a creative of some type and it dictates their future relationships with lots of other creatives right so they had one very bad experience where there wasn't a lot of compromise or a lot of kind of mutual respect or understanding. And then they don't really wanna work with anybody after that. And so I, I look at this as an opportunity, not just to build a great relationship for us individually, um, for each of you individually, but also to kind of be that bridge to the creative community so that we are able to get them more help and more um, support in the work that they're doing in shelters and rescues over time. So make all those considerations of 
not just the time that you can allot for taking the photos or, or doing the work in the shelter, but how long do you need to allot for things like post-processing? Um, how, how long might it take you to turn around images on average? And you know, that's, that's with the understanding that we all have lives <laughs> and that things come up and that you're going, going to have to occasionally say, you know, I know my typical turnaround time is 24 hours, but I have something going on. It's going to take me an extra day. And, and I think that um, those kinds of instances are so much more understandable when the expectations are set on both sides of the table. Um, what amount of time or at what interval feels good and sustainable for how often you go to the shelter or the rescue. And that's another really important kind of consideration for the long term, not just for when you're getting started. I think um, what happens not just for artists, uh, but all kinds of volunteers and, and even staff in animal welfare is that we typically, this is a field that runs on passion, right? So we go in with all cylinders firing, we're, we're super psyched um, and we're ready to give it 24 hours a day, you know, seven days a week. And that can lead to burnout pretty often because we've gone so hard, so fast. Um, so I want you to really consider what feels sustainable, not just for today or for this week or for while I'm excited, but what feels sustainable during the tough times? And what, uh, what do I think I could do for the coming year? Um, and that's, that's, again, just a moment of pause to give yourself to really um, do some deep thinking about some of this. Um, definitely something that we want to include is that this relationship can be and should be um, mutually beneficial. So finding ways that you not only are helping animals, um, but that the organization is then able to kind of thank you for your service by being able to either refer folks to you um, in some cases or post, you know, a little thank you every so often, um, give, share a discount that you might want to share with adopters, partner on fundraising and events and things like that. Whatever it is that you feel comfortable with, this would be part of that kind of coming to an agreement with the organization that, you know, um, this is what I would love to do for you and I don't need much in return, but maybe you could do X, Y, Z, and, and feeling comfortable having that conversation, I think is, is very important. So here's the final, final checklist. Um, and some of this we've gone over, but things to consider as well when you're kind of going to that, into that negotiation space, <laughs> if you will, um, or coming to an agreement with an organization is asking all these questions. So what image sizes and formats do you need? If I'm sending you all high res, um, you know, vertical photos, but your shelter software system is ultimately cropping them into really weird images or stretching them to fit that space, rather than have those images go out like that, let's have a conversation up front about what the image size and format is that you need. Um, releases, in being able to have releases, if you want to participate in something like Images with Heart or any kind of stock agency. Um, I think that that conversation always goes really well if you can have it up front and not um, not surprise anybody later on. <laughs> um, also thinking about what kinds of images they need the most. So is it that they need straightforward headshots and things like that or are they looking for images that can help them build a little internal stock photography uh, library where they have images of staff and volunteers and that kind of bigger picture messaging uh, of shelters. Um, always, always asking about if you can work with a handler uh, or two <laughs> where possible to maximize efficiency. And then uh, one of the best pieces of advice that I, <clears throat> I think uh, comes up every so often is always making sure that you have a way to track the animal ID and name as part of your shooting process so that um, you don't end up with a bunch of really beautiful photos and not really know who they belong to. <laughs> um, especially if you're working with a high volume shelter. I think that's a, that's a key to success for sure. So now that we've kind of covered all of that and, and knowing that um, many of you are already kind of this far down the road with the organizations you're working with, <clears throat> excuse me, I also want to talk about maintaining. Um, and when I say maintaining, I don't just mean maintaining your service to organizations as a volunteer, or as someone who's doing pro bono work. I also mean maintaining your passion um, and maintaining a connection to this work that feels good to you. Because 
I think that we can all, um, when, whenever you're volunteering and giving of yourself, it can be really tempting to give all of yourself. Um, but I wanna make sure that that still feels good to all of you. And I, I think this is a critical part um, to any kind of role that you have in animal welfare. So the first kind of, and my favorite saying, I, any of you who have heard me do any other presentations, I probably say this way too much, but um, not letting perfect be the enemy of good is, as a reformed perfectionist <laughs> myself, um, it's something that I really come back to a lot. Um, and I think it's a secret to a lot of different pieces of success, um, not just in the field of animal welfare, but certainly, certainly helpful. Um, so we all know, and especially if you've been doing this work for a little bit, Shelters and rescues can be chaotic at times. Um, resources and space are limited. Time is super short. Sometimes it, you end up feeling like you're giving everything you have and it still doesn't feel like quite enough or there's still animals who need you. And I want you to alleviate where your perfectionism is getting in the way, right? So if there is a way to, to work that doesn't, <clears throat> that doesn't tap you dry, you know, in terms of needing everything to be so perfect all the time. I want you to consider what those ways are. <clears throat> Excuse me while I grab a drink. Um, the photo on the left-hand side of the screen of the, the white dog that's kind of melting into somebody's lap, this dog is like my poster child for, for not letting perfect be the enemy of good because she was a dog that we met um, during a perfect exposure project in Charleston, South Carolina. And she, um, you can see that her, her belly is kind of distended and she's actually a dog with advanced heartworm. So untreatable heartworm at this point. So the shelter um, brought her in as part of a cruelty case. She was living outside her whole life and she, they were looking for her to have a, a hospice or a phosphorus um, home waiting for her. And what was happening was um, her kennel presentation was not great. And so when people were coming to meet her in medical in her kennel, she was really scared. And so not, not really putting her best foot forward. And she hadn't really connected with anybody at the shelter as of yet. Um, there were a couple of medical staff that she was pretty comfortable with, but all of the photos they had with her, needless to say, were her in the back of her kennel looking pretty scared and, um, a lot of the photos that they had of her were when she first came in as well. So she was dirtier and skinnier and just not looking great. So she was a dog that they came to us towards the end of the, the workshop they were doing. And they said, you know, could we take her out and try to like, try really hard to get a stunning <laughs> photo of her because we really need to get her into a home. Like she shouldn't be living the end of her life in the, in the, the medical ward like this. So um, because she was a scared dog, you know, we, everybody backed off. We were really quiet, really trying to set up the perfect situation for her. And this, the woman in this photo is a volunteer from a totally different shelter, had never met this dog before. And she volunteered to be the handler. And while the person who was gonna be the photographer was getting their settings um, and, and getting ready to take the photo, this happened where, <laughs> where this volunteer just had this really kind of incredible moment that that surprised the staff there that hadn't happened before um, where this dog just melted into her arms and you can see her tail is sticking up behind her leg that tail was wagging the whole time so that little little twitchy tail um, wagging between her legs and it was a situation where you know when someone says to you could you get a stunning portrait of this dog because she needs to move we could have really gotten in our heads about that and said like, oh, this is really cute and I'm glad she's happy, but we wanted to get that quote unquote stunning portrait, right? So we wanted, we wanted great lighting and um, we wanted to be down on her level a little bit more. And there's, there's a number of things that we might have said we wanna change about this photo. But ultimately this photo is where the magic happens, right? So that connection between those two is more powerful than a more beautiful photo would be, frankly. And so this is the photo that the shelter put online and this is the photo that got that dog into a home the next day. And I, I just tell that story to you because I want you to consider that when, when we have that need for perfectionism or we have that need to get, um, to execute the image that's in our minds as that perfect photo, 
um, I want you to remember that sometimes the power is in something else. And, and sometimes that something else is presenting itself to us in, in a different form. The other photo that I think represents not letting perfect be the enemy of good here is um, that dog on the top who was also a very nervous dog. And so this is another situation during a perfect disclosure project workshop where, um, you know, maybe our vision for how we were going to execute a, a nice portrait of this dog was going to be different than what we needed to end up doing. So because that dog was so scared, any any other kind of uh, trick we we pulled out of the out of our bag was just making him look more scared, right? So more squeaking at him, more trying to get his attention, more. Um, you know, of a person backing off and not not helping him feel safe wasn't helping him put his best foot forward and, and ultimately wasn't gonna help him. It was a beautifully exposed photo, but not a photo of his personality. And so allowing him to not look at the, the camera and allowing him to connect with the person instead ultimately ended up uh, being the thing that showed him in his truest and most natural and also um, most beautiful light. So, so really considering all of that. Embracing the shelter environment. So in situations um, where, you know, sometimes you might have a, a, a normal setup, right? When you go to the shelter, you may always work in one specific area. You may bring your backdrops and your lights and, um, you know, have a good routine. And that's amazing and awesome. But sometimes inevitably, or at one point, I should say, we all get thrown for a loop, right? And it it can't be <laughs> the way that we we thought it was going to be. Um, so that those are the instances where we'd really in, encourage all of you to kind of embrace the shelter environment, um, because two things can happen when we do that. Um, one, we kind of get pushed out of our own creative comfort zone, and and sometimes we we have amazing things that happen in that space, right? That space of growth. Um, but we also then have the opportunity sometimes to help the shelter show more of that shelter environment in new and creative ways. And the reason that that is so important and something that I would advocate for every so often is because I think most of us have had the experience, especially probably when you tell people that you work with shelter animals, that uh, someone will say to you, that's really wonderful, I'm so glad that you do that, but I could never do that, or I could never walk in the shelter, it's too sad or too scary. Um, and the more that we're able to show, even just in kind of a shallow depth of field in the background very subtly, but some of that shelter environment, the more that we start to invite people to not be afraid, to understand what they're gonna see when they walk into the shelter, to understand there's so much more happening there and so many amazing animals that they don't need to be afraid and that they don't need to be scared to walk in the doors of the building. And again, just working towards kind of removing some of those barriers. So now I have a, a lot of kind of examples of shelter set up and probably for, for the sake of time, I'm gonna go through some of these pretty quickly, but I have a few from um, Diana Bunch, who is a member um, who lives in Florida and she, um, used to help us teach the Perfect Exposure Project and just has the most amazing eye for just those secret hidden spots where something's gonna look amazing, even if it looks like it's just the side of a shelter. <laughs> um, so this is one of her setups where she um, is using a dog stand. So that's um, like a hunting dog stand, uh, that black table that you see in the photo. She covers it with um, just some faux fur. She had uh, one light, but then used a lot of natural light for fill. Um, and the fence and all that kind of background is so far away that you just get this beautiful kind of, um, you know, shallow depth of field and everything is about looking at that dog in that moment. So, and I love seeing her pullback shot here because this is what most of us are used to seeing, right? In a shelter environment um, and, and there's some true magic happening here. This is another just cut the, when I first saw this <laughs> and clearly I'm still stumbling over my words because I'm so impressed. Um, I love that she used a photo, uh, or, I'm sorry, a chair in this photo um, and was able to just kind of um, use such a simple environment and something that was available, could help her get the job done a little bit faster, but that ultimately has such a stunning result and, and no one would ever have known that that was a chair. There's another example of that. I just, I'm so in love with that. 
Um, this was in Las Vegas. Uh, the shelter we were working with there had uh, most of their buildings on the outside were corrugated, this kind of corrugated metal, which um, in Las Vegas on a sunny day <laughs> was not the most ideal. Um, but they did have some areas with some really beautiful open shade and that corrugated metal just turned into just the most soft kind of light gray backdrop um, that was really, really stunning. Um, in kennel photos for cats are actually like one of my most favorite things ever. Um, I think that there's just so much that we're able to do, especially for the sake of efficiency with a lot of the shelters that we work with for the Perfect Exposure Project. It's, a, it's about getting these photos done, not just well, but, but quickly. Um, most of those organizations are high volume shelters. So um, I love that everything about this cat is just, you know, eyes and adorableness. Um, and it, it's in a cat condo. This is another shelter we worked with where uh, they had no yard. So the, the fence that you see here is the edge of their property actually. <laughs> um, between their property and the building next door, there was just this little strip of grass with uh, that's actually like a cell phone tower in the background. So it was nothing uh, too stunning to look at, but um, again, that kind of shallow depth of field and being able to make this all about uh, that dog's eyes and that face. I, I, this is one of my favorite photos. You guys probably see me use this on mar marketing materials way too often, but <laughs> it's one of my favorites. Uh, this is that same shelter. So again, they had a parking lot and a building, and then there was a bus stop <laughs> um, and this bench, which was like a, one of those memorial benches right near the bus stop. Um, and so again, kind of working with what we had available, uh, there was some, we had a lot of fun with this, <laughs> with this bench and dogs who were willing to kind of hang in there. Uh, photos of people, which I'll probably say 17 more times before, um, before we finish here. Um, but photos of people, photos of people, photos of people. Um, sorry about that, guys. Uh, another stunning one this is uh in las vegas i i really enjoy this example this is from uh jill flynn um and i love that just the slight change in perspective here so all she did was move more to the side and shoot this cat from a different direction than than she maybe was going to initially and i think the result is beautiful so again just some more pullback shots i think um i get really excited by seeing what you know, different people's setups are and what different folks are doing. So hopefully you guys do too. Um, this is an example where I think sometimes, uh, not just us, but I encounter this a lot with shelter staff and volunteers where they're like deathly afraid of showing chain link um, in any photos. And this was at um, Manatee County Animal Services in Florida where um, they had a lot of really elaborate yards. So tons of chain link everywhere, but they also had like beautiful vines and Spanish moss and a lot, a lot happening in this area. And I would argue that this connection between this woman and this, this dog, um, despite that chain link is really powerful. And I think, again, can show a little glimpse of the shelter environment and acknowledge that it is a shelter um, without having any of those kind of undertones of sadness or anything like that. Um, so again, I, <laughs> I confess that you would hear us say this a million more times, but remember that including people in the photos helps to break down some of those stereotypes. It adds connection for those animals. Um, and I think really, really helps the shelter with that larger piece of storytelling. More examples of people in photos. So it doesn't always have to be super straightforward. Like here we have someone who's very much in the background, but that hand on a chest and that, that presence of a person there is still so powerful. Um, and we, I touched on this a little bit earlier, but acknowledging and kind of seeking out how you can help build stock imagery for the shelter. So an internal kind of stock imagery collection. Um, if you mention this, if, you, if the shelter has marketing staff, I guarantee they'll jump up and down. <laughs> um, if they don't have marketing staff, helping them understand why having some of those images is so important. So if they don't have to buy stock imagery when they have to do a call out for donations for kittens or a kitten shower, and they can use an internal photo, they get to speak about that photo and they get to kind of have ownership over it differently than they do when they use stock imagery. Um, and again, you're helping to tell that bigger picture story of the work, the work that's being done. Uh, this is also 
one of my favorite photos for it to to kind of do this call out for remembering to also have fun and have a sense of humor. Um, that's, that's a big talking point that we have with shelters a lot when we talk about marketing is being able to show um, the humanity of the organization, which includes being funny sometimes. Um, if a cat has a face like this and, and um, you know, is, is gonna be their own personal grumpy cat, um, why not have a little bit of fun with that? And this is a, a, mem a member, um, Samantha Hardery, who really embraced that this <laughs> this cat was was this uh, kind of personality, and it's so helpful. And so um, the immediate reaction to this photo, whenever I show it, is nothing but kind of good natured and and fun and excitement about um, the organization having a sense of humor. So here are. Um, some other topics just to just to keep in mind and again each one of these could be its own presentation there's so much new information coming out all the time um, and for our part at HeartSpeak what we would like to start doing specifically for our members is having um, you know bi-weekly or a monthly what we're going to call Animal Welfare Wednesday <laughs> where we just share kind of maybe a hot topic or something that um, you should know about related to the field of, of animal um, sheltering and animal welfare but it is really important to acknowledge um, some of these changes, which have been, you know, none of this is happening overnight. I would say this is stuff that's happening over the last decade or so, but very much more human centered, um, bringing that non judgmental approach that we spoke about earlier to the table, um, really looking at how animal control, animal services, animal sheltering in general are uh, community oriented. So, we're both responding to and helping in situations where people are in crisis and their animals are affected, and also acknowledging that um, we can probably help more animals in the community so that they never have to come to the shelter by nature of a safety net. Um, breed neutral, which is really important, and, and there are some great new studies and resources out of the University of Florida and this is actually um, an area that I spent a lot of time in in my, my previous job um, in animal welfare was looking at the accuracy of visual breed identification. So this practice of looking at animals, specifically dogs, and guessing at what their breed is, and then allowing that to determine the way that we describe or place animals. So looking at pit bulls and saying, oh, you're a pit bull, so you must not be good with other dogs or cats or kids or any of that kind of thing that's definitely gone by the wayside. And if that's something that um, you know is new information to you, absolutely reach out because I would love to share some of that, that kind of information. And I hope that it's something that we'll be sharing a lot more about in the future. Um, less restrictive in terms of adoption policies. And, and this is a big area, um, you know, whether we're talking about reduced fee adoption events or generally just the policies that an organization um, uses to dictate how and who they're adopting to, the movement over the last 10 years has been less restrictive. So let's not protect animals to death or protect them to the point that they are sitting in organizations waiting for, her, for the quote unquote perfect home. Let's, um, let's find ways to build solution with adopters and not throw up barriers to their adoption. So again, some stuff that I'm excited to get you guys more resources on in the future. Um, and in that same vein of breed neutral and less, res re less restrictive, being fo focused on the individual animal. So ultimately, if an animal has uh, behavioral needs or medical needs or special needs of any kind, letting that dictate the adoption and not blanket policies that we're gonna apply to everyone um, but rather things that we can uh, kind of customize to each individual animal. Hopefully that makes sense to everybody. Oop, dogs, uh, hopefully that's not blowing your eardrums out there. Um, so this is, I think, uh, a spot where I really wanna take a moment um, because I think this is really critical. Um, this concept that in order to do good work, we need to be well, um, is something that uh, Jessica Dolce, who's a compassion fatigue uh, educator and someone that we've worked with to, to produce a couple of resources for you all in the, the member resources area. Um, this is something that she says often and it really resonates with me and I think helps with that concept of being able to do this work for a long time, the, long, the longevity piece of the puzzle. 
Um, so part of that is sometimes finding balance and establishing boundaries. And just because work is in the last couple of years largely focused on boundaries and being able to um, say no and, and feel okay about it. Um, and some of that I think also is something we struggle with when we work with a shelter or rescue because they become very dependent on your services sometimes, right? So there's, you've established a protocol, you've established the time commitment, you're, you're there for them. And when you start to feel burned out, I think that um, what I hear from a lot of members is that they know they need a break, but they struggle with how to take a break without feeling guilty about animals who won't get their picture taken, you know, if they take a break or who won't be promoted in the same way. And so, um, you know, doing some troubleshooting from the beginning, figuring out like, are there other volunteers or staff members that you can be um, training or working with as you go along so that it, you feel more comfortable taking a break. And also realizing that as uncomfortable as this is to recognize as humans in general, if you aren't there, the gaps will get filled some way somehow, even if it's not in the way that you would like, or even in the way that the organization would like, they'll figure it out one way or the other. And so what is the most important is being able to take a break if that's really what you need. Um, because the longer that you push yourself, the closer to burnout, you know, complete and total burnout you're going to get. And what we need in this field is for you to be well so that you can do more good and so that you can do that good for a long time. Um, a couple of the strategies that Jess offers up, and, and you can read a lot more of her material. We have two handouts on our website, and then um, we also link to Jessica's website, but it's Jessica Dolce, D O L C E dot com. And she has a ton of stuff, including a couple of classes you could take if this is um, something that you're interested in. Um, but two things that I think are immediately applicable that you can try out um, are things like breathe, uh, breathing deeply, deep breathing exercises, and being able to lower your stress levels, especially if you feel like maybe lately you've been in a heightened state of stress or there's something going on that is, um, you know, causing you to spiral, spiral out. Um, and also noticing what's going right. And this is some, this is like a favorite piece of advice that I took away from one of her classes was to start really just concentrating every single day actively on listing two or three things about what went right that day. Because in animal welfare, we have a tendency to really focus on the things that maybe aren't going so well. So between the cruelty cases that we see sometimes, or just you know the general fatigue that it causes us to see animals who are without a home or who have been given up or who are in um, a state of flux, as animal lovers, that's all very stressful. And so being able to also focus on the good things that are happening. So maybe there were new intakes into the organization that day, but maybe you were able to provide one of them with a really positive experience or some extra time out in the yard or you know anything that you can really focus on as the positive thing that happened that day. Um, being able to acknowledge that and soak it in, I think is very, very important to, to giving ourselves some of that balance and perspective. So again, check out more of Jessica's work um, because I think this is a critical part of being able to do this work for a long time. Um, and also, you know, just occasionally having this conversation with yourself or, or journaling or whatever you do to kind of feed that side of yourself, but remembering why you started to do this, what continues to inspire you. Is there a way to jumpstart some of your creativity? And I find that the discussion group the member discussion group can be a great place for, for rediscovering some of that. So, um, you know, when I see members posting ice cream photos or, you know, something fun that they did, a special campaign for a senior animal, um, any of that kind of stuff, use some of that to jumpstart your own creativity. Like, let that allow you to, to brainstorm or, um, you know, even emulate, you know, with, with, um, and experiment with your own kind of ideas around some of those same topics. Um, and the final thing that I will say, because we've had some really uh, important and meaningful conversation with members around this idea, is, is the relationship that you have with an organization ultimately a healthy relationship? And we've had a couple of members who have, you know, come to us over the years and said, here's what's going on. 
I'm very seriously considering walking away from this organization and I just need some outside perspective. And I've found in almost every single one of those cases that, you know, that member has tried for sometimes years to course correct in that relationship or to, to help um, the animals that were there because they felt guilty or they felt bad for them, but that ultimately it was an unhealthy relationship or an organization that had bigger problems happening beyond just that relationship with, with a photographer or creative. So really do take that time and, and always feel free to reach out to Lisa and myself for some of that perspective. But I think that um, there are absolutely instances where you have to give yourself permission to walk away because the situation is not only not healthy, but sometimes not safe um, and certainly not sustainable. Um, and and they're recognizing that that sometimes can be the case, I hope will help you, um, you know, feel okay with a decision to walk away sometimes. So finally, this is kind of our last uh, section and we're, we're running close to low on time. So we have about 15 more minutes um, is feeding your soul and staying inspired. So some of this We'll go over um, kind of quickly, but this is a post um, that I find incredibly inspiring um, from John Buma, who's a, a member that works in Miami. Um, and last year, actually a year ago today, how wild is that? Um, he posted this kind of happy, happily ever after story that totally knocked my socks off. So um, through an interesting coincidence and kind of chain, chain of events, a dog that he photographed the day before wound up visiting his home 24 hours later and he has this beautiful little story but um, it's amazing to know and we've all had these experiences I think where someone says your photo did it your photo made it happen um, another thing that I learned from Jessica Dolce in some of her classes was to create kind of a um, like almost like a digital what is it, what would we call this like a brag book or like snapshot book of um, any time that someone kind of has told me that my work has made a difference to them or, or handed me a note after a presentation and thanked me I put all of that stuff in one place um, and when I am having an especially bad day or something is really kind of um, eating away at me I, I look back through some of those things and I think sometimes um, if it's just as simple as having a bad day, those kinds of uh, reminders of the good that you're doing and the, the real difference that it makes can completely turn your day around. So save these kinds of things um, and, and be able to look back at them. Um, I also just want to show you guys a couple of fun things in terms of adoption promotion. So this is like one of my favorite <laughs> promos ever. Um, um, one of our members who used to work uh, a lot on the Perfect Exposure Project, her name's Erica uh, Medius, and she created this uh, kind of inspired graphic from a magazine cover. And I love that we get so much information about Jeremy and also a little bit of a sense of humor. Um, there's just so much good that's happening in this. So seven years old and loving it would make a great hiking buddy. And we have all of his ID information, so it's really easy to find and track him down. Um, valuable skills, sit, stay, down, high fives all around. I'm neutered, one man's story, which is kind of like the punchline of all this. Um, and then my best friend is a cat, which is also super valuable information. So there's just so much um, creative and good and fun about this, but it's also informative. And, and I love that kind of balance of all of those things. I'm going to try to play this video and hopefully it will work for you guys. I, I'm not sure if with the webinar there'll be any hangups, but I'm going to give it a, a whirl. It's very short. Um, it's from Front Street Animal Shelter in Sacramento. And this is just a great example of using simplicity, not shying away from video, even imperfect video, um, and also a cultural moment. So this was uh, done back a couple years ago when Starbucks was doing those unicorn frappuccinos, which I don't know if any of you remember, but in the moment, it was a huge deal. It was like on the news all the time. Starbucks stores were selling out of things and it was it was wild. Um, oops, let me go back. Uh, so I wanna show you this quick video.
so again there's this is so simple right there's um there's not a lot that's complicated that's happening in that video and hopefully hopefully it played for you guys the way it did on, on my end um but essentially you know they they took a, a quick couple minutes took this dog out for a frappuccino so it was enriching she was a long stay dog so putting this little bit of extra effort um in for her was appropriate use of their resources at this stage um but there was nothing complicated about it right it's it's kind of uh corny and and cute and uh everything about that helps animals especially on social media get attention in a really positive way. And so in that video ultimately was responsible for her adoption. Um, very quickly, because we are low on time, I just wanna also call out um, that there are so many ways to use your talents um, and your, your work beyond adoption, if that's something that you're interested in. So we have a number of members whose work um, I can kind of call out here, but helping to promote com community services, um, highlighting mission and impact for some of the community programs that your organization is doing, whether that is spay neuter or medical services or community outreach, like going into communities and, and providing vaccines and things like that. Um, this kind of photojournalistic style and, and being able to help um, with those messages also has a huge impact for animals in a different way. So you're not promoting adoption, but you are helping to promote um, the, the greater work of the organization. So this is a prison program. Um, Dina Barda, who is a member, um, if you search her name in the discussion group, she has some amazing, very, very touching um, images and stories about the work that um, she has done with this organization, Second Chance, in, in the prison system. Uh, this is a photo from Kathy Kinnear, another amazing member. Um, she works with Bad Rap out in um, California. And they do a lot of community outreach, um, especially vaccination and spay neuter services. Um, and again, these kinds of images are not just helping to document the impact of those programs, they're also helping to tell the story of the organization, how much you care about the community members, which in turn helps to kind of rebrand and tell that bigger story of the organization and, and the change that you're trying to affect in the community. Um, these kinds of images, uh, and Rita, I think, has some great ones if you're looking for inspiration, um, really, really push back on stereotypes and misconceptions, especially like at the Los Angeles County shelters. A lot of the staff members have badges on their uniforms. They look very official, but then there's these really soft, amazing moments with the animals. And again, you're telling a bigger story. Like if you're afraid to come to the county shelter, you're not sure what to expect or you think that um, but it's going to be scary or upsetting. Here is an image that pushes back against that notion and that encourage you, encourages you ultimately as a community member to, to maybe get more involved or to reconsider um, where you are going to get your next pet from because look at the amazingness that's happening here, maybe in an unexpected place. Playgroup photos are like some of my favorite. I know some of you take amazing playgroup photos. I love, love, love them. But here we are pushing back against a multitude of, of myths and stereotypes, right? So we have dogs who, some of those dogs would be labeled pit bull dogs, um, playing, playing with other dogs, having fun, showing this side of sheltering that community members are not always familiar with. Um, so again, looking outside of our experience as kind of quote unquote insiders in animal welfare, and remembering that community members, especially those who have never adopted before, may not know that much about some of the work that's happening inside the shelter. Oh, I love this photo as well. So this is from a field trip hike um, at Austin Animal Center. Um, Sarah Throop took this photo. Um, and there's just so much good happening, right? So it's a, a different perspective. So outside of the shelter, an innovative program and also something that's beautiful and eye-catching and shows connection. And uh, again, something that you may um, help to tell the story of other programs of the organization or a different way of looking at maybe a long stay animal or an animal who needs a little bit more attention. And then uh, I think this probably at some point will be a whole other presentation because <laughs> uh, this is our only slide. But also remembering that, especially if you're feeling maybe like you need a little bit of a break from the day to day, or if you're looking to help in a brand new way and it's not something that you've done before, um, being able to raise funds 
uh, for an organization in need by doing mini sessions or helping out with event photos or something like that. Um, we have a fundraising guide in the member area that you can take a look at that gives some of these kinds of suggestions. Um, but I would, I would definitely encourage you to kind of reconsider all the different ways that you can be helping. These slides I'm going to let you guys kind of um, read on your own. I'll, I'll make sure that we all get copies of these slides, but there's some really amazing advice I asked in the discussion group for, um, you know, support and advice from other members. And I think that, again, this is kind of the magic of that discussion group but also reflecting back on some of what, what members have said and what they would say to each other uh, when asked, I think that there's just so much magic. It makes me so, so grateful and so proud of the community that we have um, in the Artists Helping Animals program. And this I'll also let you guys kind of read on your own, but this is a poem that um, a member, Erica Medius, wrote. Um, initially for our perfect exposure project and just kind of the marketing materials, but I, this resonates so strongly, I think with the work that you all are doing um, and really just landing on that note of how much change you're affecting. And I know that sometimes it doesn't feel like it or sometimes we need that little shot of inspiration or, or a good reminder um, of how, mu how much amazing work is happening, but you are making an incredible difference. And I, I hope that you all kind of feel that through some of the the things that we've talked about tonight. Um, last thing before I, I'll just take a peek and see if we have any questions, um, but I know that many of you saw in the discussion group, but we're doing kind of a big exciting project uh, in collaboration with Shelter Me, the organization um, that has had a TV series on PBS for a while, as well as LA County Animal Centers. And also big shout out to our member Rita Earl um, Blackwell, who is uh, someone who is, you know, on a daily basis photographing animals for LA County. Um, we're collaborating with all those folks to try to photograph every single animal in the LA County sheltering system in one day on July 13th, so almost a month from now. Um, working on some of the details in terms of like seeing if we can get some hotel room blocks uh, reserved at a reduced rate just for those that want to travel in from out of town. Um, I think that this is going to be really exciting. We also recognize that it's short notice and that it's not something that everybody can make it to. And that's okay. We have big plans for the future. Um, we're going to try to orchestrate a day of service in August where we all just kind of do our own version of this same kind of uh, project in our own communities. So have no fear if you can't make it out to this you know, it, no, no harm, no foul. Um, and we're hoping that this can be something that, that grows legs, you know, uh, across the country and across the, the globe, actually. Um, but I did want to just give a shout out to that. Um, and there's a registration link at the bottom there. Um, it's bit.ly, the bit.ly link, scene saved LA, if you want to register. And there's also information in the discussion group and an email that went out last week. And finally, I just want to make sure that you guys all feel really comfortable, um, you know, and have our contact information and know that you can always reach out to Lisa and myself um, individually. I think sometimes there is a perception, um, I know certainly outside <laughs> of, of membership, but even sometimes within membership, that HeartSpeak is a much bigger organization than it is. Um, and really, it's just little old me and Lisa <laughs> um, over here in New York. Um, so we want you to to know you know the faces and the people behind this organization and always know that you can reach out to us um you know with questions comments concerns advice any of the above we're we're always thrilled to hear from you all um just gonna take a quick peek i think i saw one question come in um i'm gonna stop showing my screen for a moment oh so we had a great question of do we always do uh, it says do you guys always shoot in raw um i know that some members shoot kind of exclusively in raw um i also know that a lot of members shoot both jpeg and raw um in situations where they need to be able to access those photos more quickly or don't have as much editing time um that's something that we kind of recommend as like a middle of the road solution if that's something that you want to look at um, but I do know that a, a lot of, uh, because we have so many members, <laughs> there's, a, I think, diversity in that answer. And, and a lot of folks do things, um, you know, their own way. But uh, 
that shooting in both JPEG and RAW can be a great solution, you know, if there's, uh, if there's any question about what the shelter is going to need. I know that for most organizations, they're going to need your finished product to be, um, you know, in JPEG format. So whatever allows you to get that to them more quickly, I think is, is the way to go in that situation. I think that that's the only question we have, and it's an excellent one. Um, I really just want to say thank you to all of you who attended. I know it's um, it's an awkward time for some of you, especially if you're not on the East Coast, or if you are, it's like a little bit uh, too close to bedtime, maybe. <laughs> but um, really, really grateful to you guys. Thank you so, so much for coming. We'll make sure that these recordings um, get put up in the member discussion group and in the um, and on the website. And we'll also send along to anybody that registered for this a uh, set of the slide deck so that you have a chance to kind of look at some of this information more closely. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I can't wait to, to continue the conversation over in the discussion group and via email. So have a great night, everybody.